Okay, that's great. So thank you everyone for coming here at uh, Vizart. This is the fifth edition of the workshop on Alessio de Bue, one of the organizers. And I'm going to do uh, some opening remarks about, uh, very short opening remarks about the workshop. First of all, I would like to thank all the organizers uh, that uh, helped us to make uh, Vizart uh, uh, possible, even though in this online version. Of course, myself, but Sebastiano Vascon and uh, Leonardo Impet, uh, Peter Bell, and uh, of course, Stuart James, all the panelists are here uh, in uh, this talk. So, this art is uh, the fifth edition. So, this art was historically associated with the ECCV conference. We started uh, eight years ago in Florence, then uh, we went into Zurich for the 2014 uh, edition. And uh, then Amsterdam uh, in 2016, uh, Munich 2018, and now uh, for the first time, hopefully and the last time as well, virtually in, uh, in Glasgow for the ECCB 2020. So the workshop uh, is, uh, can become in, during the years the home for interdisciplinary research among computer vision, digital humanities, art and cultural historians and artists. So here, uh, differently from other workshops, we have two submission track formula. One is for technical paper on computer vision, call it computer vision for art. And another one more directed to uh, digital humanities, uh, call it uses and reflection on computer vision for art, uh, where critical essay or extended as abstract can be submitted from art historian, artist, cultural historian, media theorist, and computer scientist. So it's very, generic uh, track about discussion on computer vision and art analysis. So um, this is uh, the session are split in two. One now at this very moment. So there is my welcome, of course, then the keynote, uh, the first keynote note by Andres Mayer. And then we have a, a set of oral uh, paper presentation, uh, as you see. Then we are gonna and, and the session is gonna close at uh, at noon or noon also oh, sorry uh, related to your time zone and um, then we are gonna have the second session always the time zone is set plus one uh, with the keynote speaker Aaron Erzman as the first and then we are gonna have uh, another set of oral paper and then Stuart will uh, close so James will close with some uh, discussion session at the end of the workshop. These are the uh, Wizard uh, workshop is also sponsored by the MEMEX project, the NH2020 European project um, that promotes uh, technology to help mar marginalize indi individual communities in the society to improve storytelling. It creates fundamentally um, a set of uh, app on the phone that are able to show up as uh, stories in augmented reality uh, about uh, cultural heritage assets and the experience that the people have uh, within them. So um, I would say that uh, this was a very short introduction for having everybody on board for the start of the workshop. I would like to start with uh, uh, Andreas Meyer um, talk in um, very soon. Um, so I would like to, to let you know if you want to, to do question in Zoom, you have your uh, question and answering tab where you can uh, type your question. Um, you could also raise an hand, so I made you be possible to ask the question in person as well after Andreas talk. And this also is the same for every talk. Uh, in the, um, let's say in the, in the Wizard uh, workshop. So don't be shy, of course. We're gonna happy to be as much as possible interactive uh, during this uh, uh, presentation. So I will uh, stop here and uh, I will leave the word to Andreas Meyer uh, talk. I'm sure it's gonna be pretty interesting with um, time machine and other uh, computer vision and art analysis subjects. Thank you, Andreas. So you might be free to, to start uh, your presentation. Okay, can you see? Yes, that's great. Then... Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak on your esteemed conference. It's the first time that I'm presenting here on the VizArt workshop. So it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. And you asked me to present on a small project that is called the European Time Machine Project. And I want to show you a couple of the building blocks that we're working on towards building this, what we call a virtual time machine. My name is Andreas Meyer. I'm a professor in computer science of the Friedrich Alexander University and I'm member of Germany. And I'm also a board member of the Time Machine Organization. You can also find me on Twitter with my handle Meyer underscore AK. The continent, Europe. In archives, beneath stones, in crumpled maps and winding streets, in pictures and paintings, in the depth of its green forests. History in Europe lies everywhere. How does one preserve and explore such a dense and fragmented past? How does one bring it into resonance with our contemporary world? So you can see that this European Time Machine project is a very ambitious project with the aim of digitizing more than 2,000 years of European history. You can see the different challenges in the project here. Imagine all the documents here in the State Archives of Venice. The State Archives alone have thousands of documents that would need to be digitized. And imagine all the information that would be available in these documents. Obviously, you need advanced scanning techniques here. It's 80 kilometers of shelves of documents that would need to be digitized. And then you find not just books there, but they also have all kinds of other information. So you can find essentially 1000 years of European history there. You can find maps, you can find cadaster entries, all kinds of documents. And the digitization alone is a huge challenge. However, it's not just digitization, it's really big data of the past. In 2012, the Digital Humanities Lab at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne launched the Venice Time Machine and offered unique virtual immersion into history to the development of big data and artificial intelligence technology. Since then, dozens of European cities have taken similar steps. Each now contributes to the creation of a unified temporal exploration tool accessible to all. All these initiatives are now gathered within a consortium that groups together more than 250 European partners, universities, archives, research centers, and also private companies. Time machine participants include historians, engineers, geographers, developers, entrepreneurs, researchers from a variety of backgrounds, as well as ordinary citizens, defenders of their heritage. If you look at the amount of information that is available in our history, you realize that most of the digital information is available at present day. The further you go back in time, the less digital information is there. Now, if you were to start to digitize everything, you would only get, let's say, halfway to your goals. So we believe that not just digitization, but also advanced AI, computer vision, and processing techniques are crucial in order to gain additional insights of our past. So simulation will be a key component to get a better understanding of our history. Chaque ville du réseau de la Time Machine pose des défis particuliers. Et donc chacune des équipes qui reconstruisent Paris, reconstruisent Budapest, reconstruisent Amsterdam, Anvers, nous permet de développer des compétences spécifiques. I believe that the Time Machine is the future. How we will do digital humanities and humanities in the future. What we are striving after is really building things that are used to gain more insights. 
if we had such information, we could create entirely new access to our past. So here we show a mock-up of 3D models of ancient Venice and Cataster information where we can locate different businesses inside this 3D reconstruction of the world. We can see that this gives us a very good understanding of what has happened where in the city. Also note that the reconstruction is of course a huge challenge because we are not sure about the information of our past. So we somehow have to show that information is lacking. And in this rendering, we chose, for example, all the facades to be white grayish because we can't say for sure how they have been painted in the past and what information to show here exactly. Still, you can see that this is an entirely new method of accessing the past, and it gives us insights over relations of persons, businesses, and historical information over the complete past of Venice. Now, Venice is only one example. We have many different time machine initiatives that are emerging right now. You can see there's initiatives in Amsterdam, Antwerp, Budapest, and Dresden, and many other European cities. So I want to highlight a couple of the research projects that are happening right now in the Nuremberg time machine. And these are essentially contributions from our university. And I'll just show a brief selection of different projects where I've been involved. First step, collect and aggregate data thanks to digital tools and automate everything in order to carry it out on a massive quasi-industrial scale. So we have all those data, we have to store that properly and manage it properly, but we also have to make sense of the data. If you just present to the people thousands of terabytes of data, it's meaningless. Today, science and technology can profoundly transform the cultural heritage with an impact on research, education, new applications, economy, and society at large. We also looked into scanning, and in particular, if you want to mass scan or also want to access very fragile documents, a concept called book CT may come in very handy. So you see there's documents that get damaged and destroyed all the time. Sometimes they're so heavily mutilated that you can't open them anymore. Some of these documents just fall apart when you open them and you can see individual letters falling off the pages. So you would be interested in reading them without having to open them. And my colleague, Daniel Stromer, you can see him on the top left here, he exploited the fact that some of the historical inks, actually quite a few of them, contain metal particles. So here are two different inks. One is malachite, the other one is iron gall ink, and both of them contain metal particles. We even got a couple of samples and sent them to mass spectroscopy so you can see which elements are actually present and you see that there are quite a few iron particles in these kind of inks. Because we know that we can see metal particles really well in CT, we can use non-invasive scanning techniques like the scanner you see here on the left hand side. So this is a metronome scanner which has a field of view of approximately 20 centimeters and it can scan objects at a resolution of up to 20 microns. So you essentially place the book on a turntable and then take many X-ray projections. And with these X-ray projections, you are then able to reconstruct a 3D volume. Now you can already see the next problem. If you look at this 3D volume, it's reconstructed on a Cartesian grid, but the Cartesian grid essentially never coincides with the actual book pages. So you can't read the book, but you see different pages showing through at different positions. So you essentially need a segmentation algorithm. We were choosing a variant of the Wesselness filter here in order to detect the book pages. Once you did that, we can then extract the center line for each book page. Then we virtually flatten it. And with the flattened book page, we can now compress it to a 2D image. And if you do so, you get actually quite good results. So in the top row, you see photographs of the pages. In the bottom row, you see the extracted result from a CT scan. Note that this is a mock-up here right now. This is not the result from a real historical document, 
but we are currently working towards really scanning historical documents. Now this also works for Asian books, so this may be slightly out of scope for the European Time Machine project, but you can also show that this works for bamboo scrolls. They essentially have the same problems. And here we did a test where we essentially virtually cleaned a bamboo scroll from you know, the earth and dust and rubble that it's typically contained in. We essentially do that by tracking the individual bamboo slips this then results in tracked slips like the reconstruction shown here in this image. And once you did that, then you can relocate it in the image and remove all the rubble and the dust. And once you have cleaned the volume virtually, then you can also virtually unroll the scroll. And here you see the image of a photograph on the left-hand side and the extracted information from the CT scan on the right-hand side. So really impressive results, and we can use this on bamboo scrolls, we can use it on various types of documents, and we hope that with these techniques, we will be able to access more of our past. Il y a cette idée d'être capable de, de, de fournir à l'utilisateur final des moyens complètement innovants de naviguer évidemment spatialement, Euh, même si ce n'est pas aussi évident que ça encore aujourd'hui, mais aussi de pouvoir naviguer euh, temporellement. The past thus becomes an invaluable resource to develop new tools of knowledge, an essential testing ground to train algorithms and consolidate progress in artificial intelligence. The time machine will also provide Europe with a unique ability to preserve endangered heritage. I want to show it another project that is done by my colleague Vincent Kustlein. He has been using also deep learning techniques in order to identify writers. And here you see a contemporary example. The idea is that you have some query, you have a database of writers, and you want to find the most similar writer to the query. Or you can even retrieve a number of writers that were most similar. And of course, this can also then be applied to historical texts. The historical texts may not have a clear reference of the author, but still the similarity analysis is very useful because we can essentially do a cluster analysis and figure out how many people have been involved in the creation of this document. And we also can cross check one writer against other documents, whether the same writer appears again. And this can help us, for example, for analyzing the structure of different writing agencies of the past. The main idea of the algorithm is essentially to sample from the data, then extract features, and they could be classical features or features returned by deep learning. This ends up then with some local descriptors. They are encoded into a global descriptor, and later we use this global descriptor in order to match the correct writer. Now, we've seen over the past, Vincent did quite a bit of progress, and of course, the deep learning techniques turned out to be the most powerful over the last couple of years. Well, is the problem solved? No, there are still quite a few issues. So for example, binarization is a problem for writer identification. Sometimes in historical documents, we don't know whether the reference is correct. So here we have two examples that show the same ID, but they seem to be different scribes. One reason in this case could be that those two samples have been taken at very different positions in time which means that the scribe could also have undergone changes in his handwriting, which makes it really difficult for us 
to do the correct classification. And if we want to resolve things like that, we might also need time dependent models of our scribes. Handwriting may change over time. So also an interesting idea to think about how much of the handwriting is actually inherited. So is the handwriting of people that are related by blood similar? So there are many, many interesting problems that can be investigated here. By the way, an interesting side effect is that with the methods that we use for writer identification, we can then also generate text. And Vincent just had a very nice paper about generating handwriting and not just generating the text itself, but also the brush strokes. So you can see this can also be done completely automatically using techniques from generative adversarial modeling. Il doit y avoir une prise de conscience sur le patrimoine qui doit au moins être comparable avec ce qui est en train de se passer sur la chute de la biodiversité animale. Quand un site disparaît, ce sont des pans entiers de connaissances que nous ne pourrons plus jamais utiliser pour comprendre le présent et anticiper le futur. Preserving the past in order to withstand the test of time, but also to cope with the worrisome trends in living conditions on Earth and respond to the wayward ideology affecting our times. Notre rôle, c'est vraiment construire et mettre à disposition cette base de données, cette encyclopédie, exactement dans le même esprit que les encyclopédistes de la période des Lumières qui voulaient compiler des connaissances. Ben, on cherche à, à, à compiler dans ce nouveau matériau qui est le matériau numérique, euh, cette richesse culturelle, cette richesse sédimentaire qui décrit notre passé. Well, what else do we have? Text recognition is of course a huge problem. If you want to make any meaning out of the scanned documents, we have to be able to recognize the text in there and to detect entities. So text recognition is a challenge. Also in printed books, because they have been using many, many different types. So type recognition is a problem that Matthias Sore is working on. So you, you can see him on the top left here, he's working with this type repetitorium. And with that, he then extracted many different types. So here are examples for the Roman types, the Gothic types, even more Gothic types, and even other types like Hebrew and Greek writing. And now the key idea is if you had a working type recognition, you can automatically detect what kind of text recognition engine you need to process this text. And this way you can then build specialized models that have optimal performance with respect to text recognition in that particular type. You can use, of course, deep learning here. He's using this convolutional feedforward model. It's an adaptation of ResNet and turns out that it does very good classification on page level. And now the interesting part is that you cannot just use this for page classification, but you can also use it to localize if you have different types on a single page. And this is actually the case in this example here. You can see the top and the bottom is in Antiqua, but the center is using an italic type. And we can use this type recognition trained on pages, but also localized within the page. You can also use it for clustering. Here's an example where we clustered pages of known type and we color code the type in the respective color here. And obviously you can also put this to use in pages where we are not aware of the correct type. And then we looked into the different pages and could find out that the clusters really represent the different types. The race for the digitization of our past will not only be run by representatives of our public and scientific institutions, there is still a risk of seeing our history privatized, which raises the question of our society's ability to tackle such an issue. You can argue that Google can do that better than anyone else, right? Uh, they have the best algorithms around. Uh, and I still think that it's crucial for Europe to you know, do that on our own terms. If you imagine that uh, an algorithm will only crawl those aspects of our cultural heritage that it finds most relevant to its advertisers, uh, you only get a very partial uh, idea of what's 
true things. I want to highlight one more project at this point, and this is a project by Aline Sinja. So she is in a cooperation with the German National Museum in Nuremberg, and we're looking into depictions of Martin Luther here, and we want to help to create a critical catalog of all of those images already at the time, and in particular because Martin Luther was a very well-known person, these portraits, paintings, and prints were extremely popular. So they started essentially something like a serial mass production of those paintings, and we try to build automatic methods in order to link different artists, different images, and also different contexts of Martin Luther with each other. So you can see that this then involves partially image registration between portraits and portraits, but also between prints and prints. And then you can also do multimodal. So let's say you have an infrared image and a photograph, and you want to align those two, then you use methods of image registration. And in particular challenging are the mixed type methods where Alina also has a very nice contribution that is essentially extracting the brush strokes that a human painter would do when trying to copy that image. And this can be applied to prints and it can also be applied to portraits, which then allows us to do a cross-modal mixed type registration. Also image analysis is very interesting. There's repeating elements and you can see that people have been using templates in order to speed up the mass production. And this way we can then find different elements of different images across different images using those similarity analysis methods. And we can help to figure out whether the same template was used in its image or not. A last question that we're also looking into is repeating motives. And here, of course, the key challenge is to abstract from the actual image to the motive and really pinpointing it to a certain situation or a particular depiction of Martin Luther throughout his lifetime. Well, let's look into the portrait registration. And I have a very nice result here from Aline where she was using essentially biometric approaches and the idea here is that she's using a facial recognition that is able to detect the eyes, nose, and mouth. And then we're using this biometric landmarks in order to do the cross-modal portrait alignment. And this turns out to be working really well. So I have a small animation here where we're showing this blend between the one image to the other. And you can see that we get really appealing registration results here. Of course, also the registration of prints is very challenging. And in particular, the prints may have a very similar appearance, but what you're actually interested in are the small details. So you want to figure out whether the same printing template was used or whether different templates have been used, but dependent on the pressure and the wetness of the ink, the two prints may have very different appearance. You can see it here in the left and the center image. They have probably been produced from the same template, but different amounts of pressure have been applied. And therefore, you see that the appearance is very different. Still, if we use point-like features, we can match the different parts of the image and then register the two. So you see here on the right-hand side then a fusion, and you see that both of these images overlap really well. And if you have this registration, you can now use it to analyze the tiny differences between the images. Let's say you have a wooden template that is being used for 
this printing process with these registration techniques, then you can find tiny differences and you also want to automatically highlight where things are missing. Could it have been the same template? Is there just a small piece of wood missing that broke off during the production process? Or is it entirely new template such that we can't get a general very good match? Well, so these are all very interesting questions. And if we were able to find these small differences in the templates over time, then we could probably also figure out the sequence of production. You know, if there's something missing in a print, it's likely that a part of the template broke off. And this has to be missing in all subsequent prints. Interesting and very challenging project. This is an issue of culture, identity, politics, economics, and ecology. The Time Machine Consortium must convince European society to share in this project. L'Europe est un moment clé de son histoire. Elle doit décider qu'est-ce qui est le plus important en termes d'investissement. Un des enjeux de Time Machine, c'est de donner une possibilité d'ensemble négocier l'histoire commune pour envisager et co-construire un futur. I hope I could convince you that the European Time Machine project is a very exciting project. And of course, you can find us on Twitter, you can find us on Instagram, you can go to our website. And by the way, we are still actively seeking for new members. So if you got interested by this presentation, approach me or approach others. And we are happy to tell you how you can become a member of the European Time Machine Project. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. If you've just seen that you can reach me on Twitter, you can send me emails, and I would be happy to take your questions in a following discussion. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. That was a great presentation, very inspiring. I mean, uh, you can use both the question and answer tab or raise your hand, and I can uh, allow you to make the question directly. Meanwhile, uh, we are waiting for questions. I can, I can start with a very quick one, Andreas, if it's possible. So, uh, related to, to data and data sharing, I think it's very important to, uh, especially in this uh, time of uh, really uh, data starving, uh, let's say, algorithms, uh, the way to have accessible data for, for uh, follow up with the studies. So it's going to be the time machine connected to previous uh, data, let's say, databases like Europeana, or it's going to have uh, his own environment uh, to be freely accessible by the community? So Europeana is a founding partner in Time Machine. So there's very uh, strong relations with Europeana. And we also try to encourage people to pursue open data models and um, that they have creative commons licenses. I mean, we of course would prefer uh, CC0 because that's the easiest to work with in, in kind of derivative works. 
but I think also uh, CC BY licenses and so on are really useful. And you know, if you keep track of the original source, we should also be able to to deal with that. But licensing open data is a huge issue in Time Machine, and I'm very glad that we have people from Europeana in the project that support us there because they already have a lot of experience in this section. So it would be a waste not to build on that. Okay, great. So we have one question about Lev Manovic in a moment. So, um, uh, I mean, is uh, very interesting about identify tiny differences between prints. Uh, do you use machine learning for this? I think, of course, yes. As a, uh, and is searching for general references on, on the work. So uh, that's something we can kind of uh, answer directly on the chat if it's possible. Uh, about this, but I guess the use of machine learning is pretty strong of this uh, type of uh, projects because you really need to find images, uh, image differences, even if the data source domain is uh, is changing. I guess that's the point, uh, Andreas. But let me know if you can share more details about this. Yeah. Okay. So we. So is can you still hear me or should I turn yep. off the video? Because it seems my internet connection is getting unstable. Yeah, we can still hear you. Um, so yes, machine learning is a, is a key. Okay, so key, yeah, machine learning is a key issue here. So the first thing that we are working on right now is the registration of the prints. And then we try to figure out where the differences are. And this is essentially done using subtraction imaging. But of course you don't have, it's not just the translation, rotation, and scaling that you have to estimate. But in, then it's also image characteristics like resolution and blur that needs to match in order to kind of get, um, in, in order to kind of get the differences. And then we use different imaging to see where the actual differences are. But a key problem still is to figure out whether it's really a problem that has um, been happening to the template where there's a small piece of uh, wood that essentially um, was torn off or whether not just enough ink was present when they were inking the template before applying the pressure. And there we have very close collaborations with the German National Museum because sometimes they can, they can tell from the image and they can at least make estimations which option is more likely. So the, the prints are quite challenging and I will post the website of Aline Sindel. So she has a couple of publications there. And I've just seen in the chat that uh, somebody was also interested in the writer identification and generation. And this is work by Vincent Christine. I will also post his website with all the links and the references. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Um, okay, um, another question about Gilles Bergal. Um, okay, no, this let's just reply about about uh, what uh, the previous question. So, um, any other of the panelists of Wizard would like to um, have a question? Uh, Peter, Leonardo. Yeah, I, I have a, a question for Andres, which is about the, um, the, the, the fact that Andres comes from a, a, a very uh, technical and very successful uh, computer science background rather than coming directly from the digital humanities like, like uh, some others of us, like me. And um, in the video and in uh, the Time Machine project in general, it's uh, often stated that uh, these kinds of applications to art and to the humanities of machine learning in the end produce results which are also useful for other technical uh, domains which are you know which are useful in general which i guess is a little bit like the nasa argument you know that the, the things that they develop uh, even if spaceflight isn't um, massively useful to everyone always the things that they develop end up finding their way into into all sorts of other places um, do you see this as something that's happening already or is it a kind of hope for the future as we build up the field, or is it is it not even a hope for the future, but just you know a, a, a way to convince funders? Yeah, interesting. 
Same. So right now we see rather from the other domains to digital humanities because, you know, we this book city, this is essentially because we work a lot with um, medical scanning and we thought, okay, what can we get out of a, a medical grade scanner in order to figure out what's inside of a book? Uh, we can also see, that, for example, in this project, there's the problem of extracting the layers, the pages. And this is very similar to something that we see in ophthalmology. So your eye is also constructed of, of layers. Your retina has several layers. And the algorithms that we're using to extract book pages, they are almost the same as the ones that we are extracting for, for retinal um, layers. So there are relations all across those different domains. Uh, also some of the artifacts that we see um, for example, in historical art, you know, if you have this craquelé and so on, and you want to extract that, the appearance is very similar to what you see in the production of solar cells. And there you're also interested in uh, detecting the crack patterns and uh, extracting this. So, yes, I think if you work on methods, it's not so, I mean, of course, you try to use domain knowledge and bring that in. But you can see that many of these applications and similar problems emerge in very, very different domains, from ranging from really uh, solar energy production to medicine to all other kinds of fields that I'm not even aware of. This is also one reason why I think it's important to show the things also to a general public, because there you then often meet people from various different backgrounds and they say, I have a problem that looks similar. Do you think this algorithm could also work? And then you look into it and sometimes it just does. Thanks. Okay, great. So we have still time for a couple of questions. Um, I mean, even from the panelists, if you would like to ask a question, please be free. Maybe not. Maybe I just, uh, instead of brief follow up, do you, is it kind of, was, was biological vision, uh, not, not biological vision, but vision for medicine? I think we have some connection problems with the... Uh, Sorry, yeah, was, was vision yeah. in the medical domain also water and net use and, and maybe more recently internet exporter? I'm not sure whether it's my connection. It, it yeah, no, might no. be that I have Everybody, to... Turn off the... yeah. You can mm, try to repeat the question, please. Leo, can you repeat the question? Sorry, yeah, I, I was just typing it. Um, I, I wondered whether uh, medical imaging was similar uh, a few years ago in that, in that before it used to be a kind of net importer of technologies, of, of methods, let's say, uh, like digital humanities is now. And uh, then it, it built up as a field. And I know uh, Alessio is also involved in, has been involved in medical imaging and now is, is such a field by itself that it's kind of a net, net exporter of methods. Uh, and maybe we could see something like that in an optimistic scenario in the digital humanities as well. Yeah, for example, image segmentation is something that is now or has been driven quite a bit by the medical imaging community, right? Think of all the units that are now emerging everywhere. So this is something that stems from Mikai. Okay, that's great. Any other questions? I can ask a question. Yes, first you. Okay. Um, so a lot of the the projects you presented look at very fine details. Look at like, for example, the style of text and um, a fine translation in um, uh, fine art. Did you look at anything more higher level where you're trying to interpret groups of objects or iconology, these kind of things as well within the Time Machine project? Well, I mean, right now, the, these are 
like hard tasks, but there is actually a presentation at the end of the session that tries to do something like this, that is given by Prat Mishmati. So I don't want to take um, away all of the surprises there, but I think it's a very promising approach that I'm also very much looking forward to see in his presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, let's not spoil it for sure. So, well, um, let's let's take a couple of minutes uh, to to prepare the next uh, oral uh, session in order to be ready to start. I would really thank Andreas for the presentation and his time uh, to visit. I think uh, looking forward for whatever is coming from the Time Machine project. We are really uh, really still looking forward to see a lot of uh, excellent work coming from this uh, initiative. So thank you, uh, Andreas, for your time. And uh, and uh, let's let's start with um, with organizing a bit the oral session. So Peter, maybe you can uh, uh, take the lead on this. So thank you for having me here. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you, thank Andreas. You, Andreas. Uh, yeah, we now we'll have uh, four papers in this morning session until our, our noon and then we'll um, see you again in, in the evening or in, in any time. Cantania and talking about, oh, we, we really have um, a minute so I, I could have a more elaborate uh, presentation uh, uh, and introduction of him but I uh, think I just uh, mentioned the title ECOCH, uh, Dataset and Fundamental Task for Visitors, Behavioral Understanding Using Egocentric Vision. Yes, hi. Hi. Can I share my screen? Yes, we should uh, give you that right. Can you make him a co-host, uh, Alessio, please? I can't share my screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait a minute. We just have oh, okay, to make okay. you co-host. Here we go. Please try again, Francesco. Yes. So we are perfectly in time. Um, as you see, you, you, you can start now. And uh, if you keep it short, we have also some time for, for questions afterwards. You have time until 11. So. OK. Hi, I'm Francesco Ragusa from the University of Catania. And today I present uh, my work called uh, EgoCH. That's a fundamental task for visitors' behavioral understanding using egocentric vision. A visitor of a natural site wall device allows to easily collect information about their preferences. The infrared information is used both online and in visitor, for example, describing the observed point of interest with augmented reality, and offline uh, to start the manager of the site to understand what's happening in the cultural site. This topic is currently under study due to the limited number of public data set suitable to study the considered problems. For this reason, we acquired the uh, egocentric cultural heritage data set, which is the first set of egocentric videos uh, for, to study the visitor's behavior in the domain of cultural heritage. We have the data set using multiple in different natural sites of Sicily. The first one is uh, Palazzo Bellomo, located in Sirta, sorry. And the second is the Monastero of the Benedictine, located in Catania. The data set is uh, available following link. So uh, systems uh, based on third-person vision exceed by several limitations. For example, fixed cameras need to be installed inside the cultural site, and this is not always possible. Or the fixed point of third-person system uh, make it difficult to estimate uh, 
what the visitors are, lo are looking at. And uh, the fixed cameras are easily affected by occlusion and people identification problems. Using first person vision, you can uh, solve this kind of problems. Uh, first person vision systems are able to infer what the visitor is looking at and his behavior. For example, uh, uh, what has already been seen or for how long? Cultural site is Domo, uh, located in Cusa, where we have selected 22 environments and 191 different points of interest. We acquired 57 training videos and 10 real visits, which were considered as test videos. The second cultural heritage is the Monastero of the Benedettini in Catania, when we selected the four environments and 35 different points of interest. We have the 53 training validation videos and the 60 real visits, which we consider as test videos. In this site, the points of interest are not only painting or statues, but we have included architectural elements such as halls and stairs. Videos have been temporarily labeled to indicate in every frame the environment of uh, the visitor and the observer. The subtitles in the represent the temporal animation uh, for the current environment and the current observer. We have notated uh, several things with one box notation. Specifically, each point of So. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we, we hear great. you again, but I think the sharing was stopped. Okay. I and sure perhaps, perhaps you speak a bit slower because your uh, the sound is also not so good. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, it works. Okay. Uh, we annotated the, the frame with points around the point of interest, and specifically uh, with, uh, with a couple, uh, class X, Y, W, and H, which represent the class and the, the bounding box information. So then uh, we considered uh, in the 60 test videos, we uh, are associated with uh, 60 surveys which have been administered to the visitors at the end of the visits. Specifically, uh, the visitors are asked to rate a subset of 33 points of interest, and we asked if uh, they uh, remembered the point of interest, and uh, uh, we asked the visitor to assign a rate a number ranging from minus seven to seven uh, for, uh, the, for each point of interest. So to encourage research on this topic, uh, we proposed four challenging tasks useful to understand the visitor's behavior. Uh, for each task, we have performed experiments to release as a reference baselines. The first task is a room-based localization Given an input video, we want to, to classify the correct room which, uh, in which the visitor is located. This is useful uh, to provide, for example, a specific service, uh, where am I? And for the site manager, it's useful to understand where the visitor spend more time inside the cultural site. So our plan is shown in the slide, and given a set of locations, the considered approach allows to segment a given video into video shots related to the specified locations. If a given shot is not related uh, to any of the locations, the algorithm automatically uh, rejects that video shot and assign a label as a negative segment. So uh, we, uh, we evaluated our method using FF1 score, which is a frame-based measure, 
and the AS F1 score, which is the F1 score applied to the temporal segment rather than frames, and measures the ability to detect the video coherence of drone. Uh, the second task is a point of interest recognition, and this task is different respect to the standard object recognition, because in this case, we want to recognize the point of interest observed by visitors. This can be useful to answer questions like uh, what are the most viewed points of interest or how long have they been observed. Uh, as baseline for this task, we use uh, YOLO object detector uh, for its real-time performance. The third task consists in a given a query image we want to retrieve from the database an image which represents the same object of the query image. We consider two variants for this task. In the first variant, the database contains only the reference images associated to the point of interest. And uh, we uh, ex extracted the image patches from the bounding box annotations. And uh, the whole set of these image patches is used as test set. In the second variant, we split the set of the image patches in a training set and a test set. We extracted features uh, using VGG neural network and then we classify these features using the KNN algorithm uh, with different variants with values of key. So in the task, uh, we consider the surveys collected from visitors at the end of the visit. And the aim of this task is to predict the content of the survey, analyzing only the input video. In particular, uh, the task consists in predicting if uh, uh, the point of interest has been remembered by the visitors, how the point of interest would be rated uh, by the visitor in a minus seven plus seven scale. And uh, in the, the first, uh, we, we consider two baselines. The first one is a uh, binary classification to predict if the point of interest has been remembered or not. And the second one, predicts both if the uh, point of interest has been remembered and the score assigned by the visitor. So this is taken as a 15 classification and most of it uh, indicates that the point of interest has not been remembered and the other 14 classes represent the score from minus seven to seven assigned by the visitors. So that's all uh, for attention. Okay. So, Francesco, can you can you hear me? Yeah, seems like. Yes. yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, we are on time. I think we have uh, the option for one uh, one short question, perhaps. Yeah. Any questions? I have no in Q and A or. And I'm also so there's a, a <laughs> the beginning of a, a question Lefman, which asks, did you find strong connection between um, between what? where people look and how much they like. Yeah, of course, that's... Uh... Yeah, yes, this is a new task that uh, we are studying. And uh, so, uh, we the, the baseline which we released is uh, we analyze the frequency of the people look the observe the, the objects and we, and we we find a connection between the frequency of the observed object in the epicentric videos respect to how much they like. And so this is, we release only a baseline, but I think uh, this task is, is more challenge and uh, needs to be studied in details and with other methods. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh one short question from me, uh, and, and he says, uh, sorry, he says that's super interesting also for aesthetic research. Um, 
and uh, I, I find that as well. But I have another question. This matching from the object in the video and the object from the database, does that work quite well or uh, did you have problems with that? Sorry, I, I have problem of connection. Can you repeat the question? So the last part of the question. Yes. Uh, and Lefmanovic also adds that it's not only aesthetics, but also experimental psychology of art in that field. So you have a very broad spectrum from art history towards cognitive science and psychology. But what I want to say, you have this matching of the object in the wild and of the database. So does that work quite good with your videos or did you have problems in this matching? So, uh... This is a good question, and uh, we so we don't find uh, some um, difficult uh, to this kind of matching. So uh, it's, it's a difficult uh, uh, in the, the so in the site of Monastero dei Benedettini, where uh, we have not only paintings or statues, where, where it's uh, very easy to match with the reference images. But uh, in the other site, in the other cultural site, we have uh, different uh, uh, point of interest like stairs, hallways uh, and uh, and uh, in that side is uh, very difficult to match the observed object with the reference images. I see, yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, we now go on to uh, Melvin Weavers from, um, from Amsterdam. Um, giving this paper with uh, Thomas Smith uh, from, from Utrecht. Uh, can you hear me, Melvin? Yeah, uh, are you can. Ready? Can you hear me? Yeah, very good. So, I'll check um, if I can share the screen. Yeah, now your uh, co-host should be. Yeah, that's great. Can okay. you see the screen? Yeah, we can, and we are happy to yeah, you know. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, so as you just mentioned, this is a joint effort with Thomas Smith, um, who is on holiday now. So uh, I, uh, I give him all the, uh, the credits as well uh, for this work. Uh, what we do in this paper is that we um, explore how we can use existing computer vision algorithms to study the representation of gender in historical advertisements. And we focus on three specific tasks. Uh, the detection of faces, medium types, and gender. So let's see, yeah. So uh, advertisements as a source have been uh, really important for historians uh, that study the development of consumerism and consumer society. And within this, uh, these studies in advertisements, there is one specific strand of research that focuses on the representation of gender. Um, and the question then is how is gender constructed in <clears throat> advertisements. And in the late 1970s, there was a sociologist called Irving Goffman who um, undertook a very systematic investigation of how people constructed gender in ads. Uh, and this resulted in a book called Gender Advertisements. And he came up with this notion called gender displays. And what he actually does is he offers very formal guidelines to study the depictions of men and women in ads. Uh, and these guidelines focus on, for instance, where are people uh, positioned on the ads? Um, who is the central figure? Who is looking to who? Uh, what are the position of their hands when they're engaging with each other? Um, and Goffman did this using uh, qualitative methods. So he close read uh, about 400 advertisements uh, that were published in a relatively short period. Uh, and what Thomas and I tried to do is replicate Goffman's study using more data uh, over a longer historical period and also add more statistical analysis to what's actually happening in these pictures. Um, and there have been some replication studies already uh, that have annotated small sets of images, but we think with um, a computer vision and the combination of uh, large repositories of digitized visual material, it makes it possible to study these gender displays on uh, over more extended periods, over longer, uh, on larger samples, and thus 
adding more robustness and possibly corrective to some of the claims that Goffman has made in this book. Uh, so basically what Goffman does is he offers guidelines on what we should actually look for when we study images. And in art history, such guidelines have been, uh, are more developed than in cultural history. Uh, so we think Goffman's work is actually a useful starting point uh, to then turn to computational methods to detect specific elements in images. Um, so, but before we can actually replicate these studies of Goffman's work, we first need to establish whether we can actually apply existing computer vision methods uh, to this type of historical material. Uh, and this paper examines the use of computer vision for identifying, identifying gender in ads between 1950 and 1995. And it does so through three main tasks. Uh, one is face detection, the other detects the medium type, and the last, the gender. Uh, and there are some challenges involved uh, in working with these ads. That's the uh, temporal dimension in the representation of gender, the way people express gender, the way people look changes over time. Um, there have been technological developments in printing technologies. An ad from the 1950s looks very different from a glossy ad from the, for instance, the 1980s. Uh, and then there are these different medium types, illustrations and photographs. And these illustrations can be very realistic, but also quite abstract. So these are all kinds of challenges involved here. Um, and what we think is, if we're able to detect faces and also the medium type and the gender, we can use this information to enrich uh, historical collections of ads and then use this information uh, for uh, questions related to these displays of gender. Uh, but first, uh, we need to be check, can we actually detect uh, these features in images? Um, so a little bit about our data set. Um, our data is drawn from a larger data set called Siamese set, which contains uh, about 1 million ads uh, uh, post Second World War from one Dutch newspaper. And from this larger set, we sampled about a thousand or we sampled a thousand images per year for the period 1950-1995, uh, thus resulting a set of 45,000 images. Uh, and then we had annotators, six annotators draw bounding boxes around faces and annotating the gender um, of the people in the ads. Uh, and in the paper, we discuss a bit in, in a bit more detail the annotation process. Um, and what we can see is out of these 45,000 images, uh, about eight and a half thousand uh, contained at least one face. And in total, we annotated about 10,000 men and eight and a half thousand women. Uh, and on the figure on the slide, we can see the average number of faces in a single ad, uh, an ad that contained a face, uh, either male or female. And we see that the average number of male faces has more variance than that of female faces. And in part, this variation is due to uh, pictures with groups of people, uh, often sports teams, which often include only males. So this really boosts uh, ads that have a lot of faces that are men. Um, and this finding in itself is already quite interesting when we're thinking about, the, about gender representations in, in group settings, something that Goffman also writes about. Uh, the, the figure also shows that uh, around 1975, the average number of female faces starts to decrease and remain lower for the uh, rest of the uh, uh, period. Um, one explanation could be that around this time, the newspaper merged with another newspaper and the readership changed. Uh, and the newspaper started to focus more on businessmen as its main readership, uh, rather than uh, the, the more uh, open uh, uh, view they had before. Uh, and one other thing to note about the data is that the images have a huge variance in image size. So the ads can be really big or really small. Uh, and the size of the faces can be, uh, can vary a lot. Um, and the faces that appear in these ads, they do not always appear in iconic ways. Uh, so they're not always the central object of, object of the image. Sometimes they, uh, they appear on the side. So let us turn to the first task, face detection. So what we tried is we, we used uh, three different uh, algorithms, uh, OpenCV uh, DNS module, uh, dual shot face detection and retina face, and we compare these these three. Um, I won't go into the detail of these algorithms. You can find a bit more about this in the paper. 
Um, for OpenCV, we use the default face detector weights. And for the other two algorithms, we use uh, weights pre-trained on the wider face data set. And uh, we look at average precision uh, to compare the performance of the algorithms. And we find that uh, the dual shot face detection uh, reaches an average precision of 71%, uh, retina phase of 68%, uh, both clearly outperforming OpenCV, which only reaches about 20.5% average precision. Um, and we think that this better performance uh, most definitely can be explained by the ability to detect phases with a larger size variance, which OpenCV quite, finds quite difficult to do. Uh, although when we uh, review the false negatives, we find that very large phases, as the one we see on the slide, are often not detected. Uh, and this has to do probably with the scaling algorithms of the, uh, uh, the scaling algorithm. Uh, which prohibits drawing a bounding box around really large images. So we need to look at the optimization of, of the scaling in this case. Um, so medium detection, um, as I just mentioned, faces can be represented in many different styles. Uh, and so what we try to do is first detect the face, extract the face, and then see if we could classify whether something was a male or, uh, or a, a photograph or an illustration. So something drawn or actually a, a picture. Um, and for this, we used a, a pre-trained VGG16 network, uh, and then we used the search to find the actual layer that was best to predict uh, the outcome of something being an illustration or photograph. And on top of this, uh, the encoded vectors uh, in this layer, we trained the uh, uh, linear SVC. And as you can see, uh, using tenfold cross validation, we reached an accuracy of 0.91. Uh, in the uh, um, ability to classify whether something was a photograph or an illustration. So that, that works pretty well, actually, uh, when looking at faces. Um, so the last task is the gender detection, uh, in our case, the most important task. And for this, we fine-tuned uh, VGG face, uh, which is a VGG16 network um, with pre-trained weights on face data sets. And we fine-tuned it in a two-step approach. Uh, as part of the first step, we only fine-tuned the head weights. And um, after this, we unfroze the, the fully connected head layers and added a final convolution block and also fine-tuned this as well, which in our case worked really well. Uh, and using this, we reached an F1 score of 0.92. Uh, but we also tried to see if we could make four classes, so not only male and female, but also male illustration, female illustration, male photograph, and female photograph, uh, which is a more difficult task. And then we reached uh, uh, an average or an average of uh, 0.85. Um, so in a way, um, it could make sense to, if we want to have a focus on a particular medium, to first classify the medium and then apply gender detection. Uh, although as we show, even if we ignore the, uh, the, the medium type, we can still estimate gender uh, with a high degree of accuracy, regardless of the medium. So what we're doing here is first detecting the faces using uh, some of the state-of-the-art face detection, extracting the faces, and then we can do the uh, gender classification. So it's basically a two-step process. Um, so with this paper, we have uh, presented a data set of 45,000 annotated advertisements, so annotated for the, uh, their faces and gender. Uh, we evaluated face detection algorithms on this historical material. Um, we trained a visual medium classifier to separate photographs from illustrations. And we trained or we fine-tuned a, a gender classifier on the extracted faces. Um, and so we have shown that we can detect faces, visual medium type, and gender with a high degree of accuracy. Uh, in historical advertisements. However, it still remains a challenge to detect gender when faces are of low quality, relatively small or relatively large. Um, and further optimization of scaling and upscaling of the images to improve their resolution might solve these issues. Uh, notwithstanding these concerns, we are confident that we can apply these algorithms uh, models to enrich uh, our collection of, of uh, historical ads and use them in a future study where we actually want to replicate the uh, formalizations that Goffman has made about uh, 
gender displays using uh, larger data sets. This is work that we, uh, we intend to uh, start working on uh, as we speak. Okay, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, thank you, Melvin. I, I think we have uh, questions. We already have one in Q&A and uh, we have three minutes about, so uh, please have uh, short questions and short answers. Um, yeah, Lefmanovic wrote, what is very interesting and important for cultural analysis is not only finding proportions of female and male faces, but also how precise the net can identify them if in some cultural data, some period, and so on, the precision is smaller, it may mean that in this culture or period, the gender separation was less strong, stronger than in another cultural period. So there's a very good DH paper um, he's sending to, and you can ask him via mail at uh, left at gmail. Uh, yeah, do you want to go? Yeah, I totally agree uh, with Lev on this. Um, what we've also done is we not only looked at the images for which the uh, model is very sure that it's either male or female, but also these sort of um, uh, these these boundary categories, these uh, somewhere in the middle. And um, what you can then do is see are there specific types of products that feature, for instance, faces that are not clearly male or female. Uh, and in some cases, also quite interesting to using um, activation layers to check what is it actually in the face that makes the algorithm think it's either a male or female. And of course, beards and mustaches are, are obvious signs that it is a, is a male. Um, but in some cases, it's, it's also quite interesting how hairstyles are actually uh, pushing it into a certain direction. And especially hairstyles are very dependent on the period. So you can definitely use these algorithms also to, to get a better understanding of these, uh, uh, these representation of gender uh, over time, yes. Yeah. So that's interesting that you, on the one hand, you have this scaling, but uh, on the other side, you also have to uh, look into the details of, of cultural changes. But we have another question from Pratrit Mishmatu. Um, hey, hi. Yep. Hi, hi, Peter, thanks. Uh, Melvin, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have actually two questions. Peter, is that okay to ask? Short and fast, yes. Okay, cool, okay. The so first question was based on the data that uh, did you also do some data analysis on what kind of ads did you use for the images that you chose? Like, were it cosmetic products or was it, were it sports products or something like that? Like, do you have that in your paper so I can look into? Because that would be very interesting to look how the data set is created in terms of finding those genders in the first place. And, okay. And the second question is, uh, how do you ethically uh, fight this question of um, defining or uh, categorizing gender into two parts, male and female? So that's basically what I wanted to ask, please. Mm -hmm. um, so on the first question, we, uh, we didn't add any uh, categorization to the images. Uh, although when we were annotating them, we, we had a look at a lot of these images and uh, we got an idea of um, uh, what types of products were actually advertised. Uh, so one way could be to use some NLP to get a better understanding of, of what kind of products are advertised. A difficulty there is that uh, because a lot of ads use logos and, and particular font types, it's quite difficult with OCR to get the information out of there. Um, so no, that would definitely be uh, an addition to the data set to enrich it with this kind of information. Um, concerning your second question, uh, a very important question. Uh, in the paper, we discussed this a bit more, um, this notion of gender and especially gender as a binary category. Um, one thing that I could add here is of course, uh, companies such as Google have refrained from actually uh, using this binary classification of, of male and female. Although in the case of, of these gender displays and these ads, often ad makers resort to these very um, crude ways of, 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 uh, of targeting a certain audience of males and
All right, we are back. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, this was a Zoom uh, Zoom uncertainty. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, it's beyond our control, so it seems everything got dropped. But you should be back in altogether. Uh, yeah, sorry for uh, interrupting the question and answer. Maybe we can go over the next uh, talk. We have to, yeah, we have to. Yeah. So it, it's uh, Nikolai Ufer's turn now. Nikolai? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we sure. can hear you very, very yeah. well. Uh, okay. Nikolai Ufer is um, talking from, from Heidelberg University in the group of Björn Omar and uh, talking about object retrieval and localization in large art collections. Um, you may just start. Um. Yeah, and there were some typos in the ECCV program. I uh, hope you uh, apologize that. Okay, are we ready? Yep, please. Yep. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Nikolai Ufer from the Computer Vision Group of Heidelberg University. I'm excited to present our work, Object Retrieval and Localization in Large Art Collections Using Deep Multi-Style Feature Fusion and Iterative Voting. This is a joint work with the art historian, Dr. Sabine Lang, and my, uh, my supervisor, Professor Björn Omer. For art history, it is crucial to analyze the relationship between artworks to better understand individual works, their reception process, and to find connections between them and the artists. Thereby, it is of particular importance to find links between image regions containing motifs or objects across different artworks. This is essential to identify the popularity of motifs and topics and to study how they have been adapted and sometimes altered in form and content during space and time. Um, digitization has produced, a large, has produced large image corpora with up to millions of images. This gives researchers access to new data sets and the possibility to conduct their analysis on a large scale. However, manual methods are inadequate for this amount of data and there's a need for machine-supported systems. Uh, some researchers propose systems which automatically find visual relationships. However, these approaches are very time-consuming as they require a comparison between all possible image pairs and are limited to small collections. Therefore, we focus on the task of large-scale object retrieval and localization in the arts. With an efficient search system where the user selects a query region in the image, and the algorithm finds corresponding regions, art historians can find relative, li relative links through several searches faster and more targeted compared to fully automatic methods. The task of identifying matching re regions across a data set is known as visual instance retrieval. Computer vision has presented efficient methods for photos. However, applied to artworks, they reveal severe deficiencies because of diverse motive and massive domain shifts induced by differences in techniques, materials, and styles. Therefore, specifically tailored algorithms for the arts are necessary. Previous approaches use off-the-shelf CNNs, which are fine-tuned in a supervised fashion, or self-supervised methods, which mine corresponding regions between image pairs. However, these approaches require either a lot of manual work or they do not scale and do not generalize to large inhomogeneous collections. In contrast, we circumvent these issues and utilize generic pre-trained features and current style transfer models to improve their style invariance without any additional supervision. Our main contributions are twofold. First, we present a multi-style feature fusion which successfully reduces the domain gap and improves overall retrieval results in art collections. Given a data set, we stylize all images according to a set of fixed style templates and by mixing their feature representation, we project them into the same average style domain. Second, in contrast to previous sliding window-based approaches, we introduce an iterative routing based on local patch descriptors. This has the advantage that we can predict well-localized areas with any rectangular shape regardless of the local patches we use for the image encoding. Furthermore, by this several weak local search queries are combined and provide more reliable search results. Um, let's get into the details of our multi-style feature fusion. It consists of two main steps. First, we try to find stable and a stable and diverse set of style templates, which we're using for the universal style transfer model. 
Therefore, we project all images into an embedding space using a pre-trained network and, up, and apply k-means on their pairwise distances. Then we select the k images which are closest to the cluster centers as our style templates. Here we set k to free since this has since this has proven to be a good trade-off between performance and computational costs. In the second step, we utilize our style transfer module, which takes a content image IC and a style image IS as input to synthesize an image with the content from the former and style from the latter. Now given an input image I and a set of proposals, we stylize the image with respect to all diverse, diverse style templates and fuse them by taking the mean over the feature channels. Here we also take the feature of the original image into account since it contains fine-grained information that can be useful for the retrieval task but is lost during the transformation process. Given the proposals and a new image representation, we apply precise void pooling on the aggregated feature maps to obtain the local feature descriptors. Finally, we apply principal components analysis and whitening to reduce their dimension. Let's get to our retrieval system. It consists of an offline preparation stage and an online search stage. During the offline preparation stage, the local patch descriptors for all images are extracted, compressed and stored in a search index. This initialization step has to be done once. Afterwards, the index can be kept in memory or stored to, or stored to disk and loaded if needed. During the online search stage, the user selects a query region, local query patch descriptors for this region are extracted, and with the search index and our voting, retrievals are found. Okay, let's get into the details. The first step of the online preparation stage is the extraction of local patch descriptors. For each image, we extract up to 4,000 quadratic patches on multiple scales on a fixed grid. For these patches, we extract their multi-style feature descriptors as described previously. In the second step, the search index for the fast approximate nearest neighbor search is generated. Therefore, all descriptors for all images are compressed and stored in the index, where we use the inverted file index with product quantization. The index is stored and the search is conducted on a GPU, which leads to a significant acceleration. After the offline preparation stage, the data, is the data set is initialized and the user can search across the data set. Therefore, he selects an image and a rectangle as query region. For this image, we extract local patches and select the most discriminative within the query region and extract their multi-style feature descriptors. The second step is the local feature voting and vote ag aggregation. For this, nearest neighbors of all selected local query patches within the query region are determined with approximate nearest neighbor search using the index. For the image ranking, we utilize majority-based voting where we simply sum up the similarity scores of local matches within each image. Finally, to find geometric con consistent retrieval boxes within the image, we apply a voting scheme on the local matches of the most promising images. Here, each k nearest neighbor of a local query patch votes for the center of the retrieval bounding box in an image. These votes are aggregated to a voting map of this image, and for the best retrieval box in the image, we, take, uh, we simply take the position of the maximum in the voting map. In the last step, um, we perform local query expansion to improve the feature representation by taking the mean of the 10 most highly ranked local matches. Besides the local query features, we also update the voting vectors and repeat the voting procedure as described previously. Okay, let's get to the experiments. We evaluated our algorithm on five different benchmark data sets. First, the Bruegel data set, which consists of around 1,500 Bruegel paintings from Shen et al. To investigate the large scale scenario with a lot of distractors, we also introduced the Bruegel 5K and Bruegel 101K data set, where we extend the Bruegel data set with an additional 3,500 and 100,000 randomly selected, selected paintings from WikiArts. Following Schengen et al., we also evaluated our approach on the large time lags location, short LTLL, and the Oxford dataset. Um, first, I'm going to present our ablation study. In the first table, we investigated the effect of our multi-style features. For this, we measured the performance of our algorithm with pre-trained um, pre on ImageNet or fine-tuned with the self-supervised approach of Schengen et al. 
it can be seen that our improve, uh, approach improves the results in all benchmark data sets. The improvement compared to pre-trained features is especially high for the ART data sets, since there's a particularly large domain gap due to differences in colors and styles between queries and targets. In the second table, we investigated the effect of our iterative voting. For this, we measured the performance for searching only with the selected query region, for searching with the first round of voting, and for searching with our full approach. We see that the first round of voting improves especially the results on the LTLL and the Oxford data set, where the performance on the Bruegel data set is smaller, since the size of the query regions for this data set are also small. The second round of voting with, with our local query expansion improves the results on all data sets. Mm, let's have a quick look on the computational costs. We compare our algorithm with the sliding window pro approach of Shannon R. It can be seen that our approach is much faster. The search time for one query across a data set with 100,000 images takes around 10 seconds, where the method of Shannon R requires more than four hours. In table three, four, we summarized all benchmark results. Here we can make the following observations. First, we outperform all methods on all benchmark data sets without fine tuning on the retrieval task and with this much smaller feature dimension. We improve the state of the art on the Bruegel data set from 76.4 to 88.1. Second, the experiments on the Bruegel 5K and 101K data set shows that our method is much more stable against distractors in contrast to self-supervised approaches. Let's see some qualitative results. In this figure, we see a comparison of our approach and Shannon et al. on the Bruegel data set. As you can see, the first retrievals of their method are correct. However, their results become significantly worse for higher ranks, where our approach provides much better results. On the next slide, we provide qualitative results for the other data sets. The first row shows, um, shows full images and the second zoomed in versions. We see that our algorithm can retrieve and localize objects precisely despite, despite, changes, in partial, despite changes in perspective, partial occlusions, aspect ratios, and even for small motifs. Um, to conclude, um, we've presented a search algorithm to find and localize motifs or objects in an extensive art collection. Our algorithm is based on new multi-style feature fusion, which re reduces the domain gap and thus improves instance re retrieval across artworks. In contrast to previous methods, we require neither object annotations, image labels, nor time-consuming self-supervised training. The presented iterative routine with recent GPU-accelerated approximate nearest neighbor search enables us to find and localize even small motifs with an extensive data set in a few seconds. We have validated the performance of our model on diverse benchmark data sets, including art collections and real photos. We've also shown that our method is much more stable against distractors compared to current state of the art. Okay, with this, um, I conclude my talk and thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you, Nikolai. Yeah, I, 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 I hope so. And I have also one. Uh, and we mm -hmm. already have a question I can directly uh, read out. Um, can you expand on why the pairwise comparison isn't feasible? I understand it might take a lot of time, but even if it takes weeks, once you're done, you have all matches. The body of data is unlikely to grow extensively, so it can be a one-off thing. I wonder now how likely you are to find unexpected or new motives as human bias is always inserted when using the queries. So that were two questions from Nana. Okay, yes, to the first one. Uh, it is very time consuming because you have to compare all images pairwise. Sure, if you, if you don't care how long this takes, if you, yeah, for example, I also, uh, for example, if it's okay for you, if it takes uh, several weeks to get um, this, this retrievals, then it's fine. But I think for most art historians, it's more interesting to get faster feedback to see, okay, which, for example, which queries can be found reliable and also, um, yeah, 
are more reliable. And I think most art historians are more interested in specific questions. So they are interest, interested in specific motives. And for example, if they have to wait, then um, yeah, maybe weeks until they get some results and they, they find, okay, the, the algorithm couldn't retrieve their motive. I think such an approach, approach is, very, um, is not very satisfying for an art historian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that I hope that but answers the question. This is more so, a question for for an art historian, historian, and for a person who who is actually yeah, I'm, interested in this approach. As I am, I, I would say as the same, and I think also the the question comes from that direction that uh, getting results is more important than uh, than the time. Of course, some things we want to. Uh, have directly, but at the end, we also uh, wait on books or uh, so other sources uh, quite a while. Uh, so that's, that's that's fine. But of course, it's impressive how much uh, you expand that now, and um, and that was also a compliment by uh, Lev Manovic, who said that it's excellent work and interesting to see. Um, uh, we have a, a question from Bradmesh. Uh, you also see, um, uh, is the code uh, already public? Or uh, that was also my question. Uh, what, what are you doing now? Do you want to uh, put it online directly? Do you have tests uh, on that with, with experts, domain experts, and so on? Uh, no, it's at the moment, it's not pu publicly available. Um, at the moment, we are working on an interface so that people can really use it. Yeah. Okay, so we have to stay tuned on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as we also started la uh, later, we, we, we still have time for one or two more short uh, questions. Uh, in the meanwhile, I, I may um, give some, some context as well. Or uh, you, you use this Bruegel universe, of course, because it, it has a lot of similarities. You, uh, um, do you want to have other data sets soon or um, what's the idea? Um, this is one problem at the moment. There are not that many data sets um, with annotations. So, um, so Shen et al um, collected this Bruegel data set and also annotated this data set. Um, at the moment, we are not collecting a um, specific data set because yeah, it's, it's very time consuming. And uh, I'm, for example, also not an, an, an art historian. And for me, it's, it's difficult to, to, to gather this data set. And yeah, so this would be one possible direction in the future. Yeah. So as, as you see, we in the chat, we have another uh, question for the uh, for the code so, so there is still uh, a huge uh, demand on, on open source perhaps that also can be a hint in that direction um, is there any other question if not I would thank you and go on from the from the panelists perhaps mm -hmm. okay then thank you no, we're, we're not so oh. fast. We have another question from ah, the okay, yeah. uh, Patches are always rectangular in your method, mm -hmm. or can it be a complex shape? Um, so for the image encoding, we're using quadrat quadratic patches at the moment. Um, and uh, for the retrievals, like you can see here in this LTL data set, we are also considering that the retrieval has the same aspect ratio, um, has the same aspect ratio as the query, um, but more complex um, regions for the query and the retrievals than, than rectangles with, with arbitrary aspect ratios, ratios are not possible at the moment. Yeah. Um, I'm also not sure if this is very important for art historians. I think they are probably happy if they get some, yeah, some rough <laughs> localization of the object. If they already get some boxes. Yeah, I think in, in some cases it, it, it would make sense, but of course it's just another feature and not so much into the uh, basic uh, retrieval and uh, yeah, uh, architecture you, you build. 
but but uh, of course it, it may be a feature we 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 uh, you should uh, give at a certain uh, certain moment yes but yeah that uh, thank you thanks again uh, Nikolai for um, giving that insight and we now go to um, a paper by uh, Tilman Marquardt uh, and uh, Pratmesh Matu understanding compositional structures in art historical images using pose and gaze wires. Uh, can you hear me, Pratmesh? Uh, you're... Yes, Peter, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm basically gonna play a video of Tillman and me. So we did it together. I'm gonna play that. Just let me know if you can hear that, okay? Yes. Cool. Could you hear? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we hear you good. And as video, uh, we don't, uh, do we? Yeah, we see, we see everything, also the video. We see the video, but uh, the, the audio is sometimes a problem, so let's try. You just let me know if you can't hear, okay? Yeah. I I think you have to share also the, the audio, sorry. There is a way to share the computer audio on Zoom. Okay. Will you share the video? Let me do that. We would hear the recording as well. Can you know? You can. Hello? You still no, we... something from the video, I think. You can find it in the top bar, so the little bar that drops down at the top of the screen. If you go to options in that, then you should be able to add it. So for me, it shows that it is connected to the computer audio somehow. Yeah, let's try again. Okay. Mm. No, can't hear anything? No. Would you be able to uh, over talk it? Mm. Or should we try again? We have a bit of time. Um, I can try. Otherwise, I can share the video for you on your behalf. Yeah, that, that, that would be great. Thank you. focused in art history. Hello and good morning everyone. Yeah, now I'm it works. Marquardt, and today I'm going to present a very brief idea of understanding compositional structures in images more focused in art history. The picture on the left is Giotto's uh, The Kiss of Judas painting where you can see Jesus and Judas kissing each other while there are a lot of protagonists looking in that direction. And apart from that, we see hand of a person on the right pointing towards the same direction and a person holding a weapon in uh, also again the same direction. And combining all of them, we get a line um, which we see on the image on the right. And uh, the picture on the right is Max Indahl's compositional analysis for the image on the left. And Max Imdahl um, yeah, developed this compositional analysis in his paper in the 1980s and focused on how artists use the structure and colors and how the foreground and background are separated. And uh, motivated by his analysis, the question mark on the right is what we ask that given the existing uh, computer vision techniques, can we generate something similar to Max Imdahl's analytical canvas 
for uh, that um, from a computer vision perspective we also add poses and gazes as interesting compositional elements. And here's the brief outline for the rest of the talk. I will introduce the problem, explain the proposed method in a comprehensive manner, present and discuss results and conclude with outlook and contributions. For art historians, it's very important to understand narrat narratives using scenes. They spend hours and hours on searching images and then understanding one image. And the high-level interpretation is ambiguous compared to low-level interpretation, as it is easy to recognize small objects and protagonists in images and hence it makes sense to build a bottom-up approach by detecting objects, persons and then relations. And now the compositional elements can be considered as action lines, the line along which the main action happens, and action regions can be considered as the region which is important um, where the most important information is in the image and where uh, the focus uh, is laying from all the protagonists. And uh, the foreground and background separation is the curve that separates the protagonists and major actions from the static information that doesn't have any impact on the understanding of the scene. And combining all of them, the problem we are attacking is can we find and visualize these image compositions without label data. And uh, for that we propose our image composition canvas which, which, uh, which is built up using the following elements. We start with a semantic foreground and background separation generated with a modified k-means clustering on the original image and as foreground color we select the color which is most dominant around the protagonists in the image. Then uh, we add these green lines, which are the local action lines showing um, an abstraction about the protagonist poses. And lastly, we generate the global action lines and action regions for the canvas. And uh, these are visualized by the yellow line in the Turkish dot. And the fundamental element for the generation of the compositional element is the detection of the poses of the protagonists. And for this we use an open pose uh, pre-trained with the 25 key points model. And we can uh, then use the pose information to detect the dominant colors in the foreground around the protagonists. And to do this we propose a pose-based in-painting method following by a k-means clustering. And we also use the pose information in our action lines and regions detector, so let's discuss each of this in more detail. The pose lines generation, and for, for the image composition canvas, we are only interested in a single line for each protagonist to quickly see the higher level relationship between these persons. And on the right we see the 25 key point output from open pose, and open pose outputs each um, of these key points with a coordinate and a quality score. And um, yeah, so one intention would be to abstract this whole uh, 25 key points with a single line from key point 0 to 8, but then we would lose a lot of information given by the orientation of the feed. And also choosing these fixed key points could cause problems because especially in art images the output from open pose is often missing some key points as we can see on the kneeling person in the middle where we have not detected uh, the lower key points here. And uh, to capture all the information given from the head to the feet we propose our triangle abstraction method. And for this we select for each triangle corner point the post key point with the best quality and most fitting locations. For example, if key point 14 is not available as here, um, we select key point 12 as the best option available for the right corner point. 
And uh, with this triangle, we can then draw the final post line from the top corner point to the bottom center point. And for the global action lines and action regions, we start by approximating the gaze direction by using the bisection vector from uh, these uh, three key points. As we can see here, this is the bisection vector. And we then generate gaze cones around the bisection vector, depicting rough gazes of the characters, as we can see them here in light uh, green. And the area in purple is the intersection of all the gaze cones, which can be considered as the area of interest. And uh, using the centroid of this area of interest and average of all gaze slopes, we draw a line, which we call the global action line. And the center we mark in uh, two keys. And for the semantic background and uh, foreground separation, we start with applying some smoothing filters to the input image to remove uh, small details like cracks and color patches. And uh, then we generate a mask using the convex hull around all the detected post key points and also always add a small border to the mask because many input images have a frame uh, photographed as well and we want to inpaint that as well. And then uh, under this mask we inpaint the images and on this inpainted images we then use k-means with a high number of clusters like uh, 12 clusters and uh, then we use the, the pose information again to check which colors are most dominant in the inpainted region below the protagonists. And uh, finally we, we replace these detected foreground colors in the k-means output uh, with the most frequent foreground color as we can see on the right. And uh, optionally in uh, we, yeah optionally we can also generate a binary foreground background mask as seen here where we display all the foreground colors in white and the rest in black. And this was the method we developed for creating image composition canvas and uh, my co-author Pratmesh is now taking over with the results. Thank you, Tilma. Before talking about the results, let's talk a little bit about how we chose our data. So we chose images that Max Imdahl showed in his analysis, which were Giotto de Bourdon's fresco paintings from 13th century. These paintings came from Shrovigny Chapel in Padua, Italy. In order to test our method for its domain agnostic performance, we chose 10 images, random from Coco dataset, of course, which should contain people, five images from Annunciation of the Lord and five from Baptism of Christ. Since there were no benchmarks, no methods for comparison in a quantitative manner, we did a user study for evaluation of our algorithm. The focus was more on the number of evaluators than the number of images used for the study. So we chose 11 images in total, six from Giotto's paintings, one Annunciation, one Baptism and three Coco images for the users to annotate the compositional elements. In all, 72 users participated, out of which 10 were experts and the rest of the 62 were considered as non-experts. Note that we considered those who have more than two years of experience in art history as an expert. In order to evaluate the action regions, we used LT distance and standard deviation. For action lines, we used house top distance and angular distance. Note that we compare our ICC with experts, non-experts, and also we internally compare experts and non-experts to see how much they support each other for sanity check. Here is the user interface of our study. As you can see, here nothing has been done because this is the interview face showed to them. And here is one of the user has done the annotations for the task. You can see over here that there is not much difference between the elder distance. So we can say that there's a high agreement with the actual regions. As you can see here, the house of distance is 664, which is 36% lower than the worst distance. So there's much scope for improvement. But for angular distance, you can see that the distance between combine ICC and all the average evaluation it's approximately to 36 degrees which the maximum is 180 so we're quite close to the action lines. 
Now let's take a look at the qualitative results. Here you can see one example from the case of Judas as mentioned before and one from the Annunciation of the Lord. The first column are the original images. The second column basically shows the action region results by the evaluators in red. A white dot is the centroid of all them and the cyan one shows the ICC. We can very clearly notice that they are not far from each other. The third column shows all the evaluators uh, action lines in red and the ICC generated in yellow. And here also we can see that we did a decent job. The eye fixation maps are the regions where humans focus in a particular image and they correlate well as our action regions can be seen. However, our approach has a drawback of horizontal lines. When the lines are shifted by angles, it tend to does not perform better. When tested on other domains, we see that our approach performs quite well. As observed in the first and the third columns are the original baptism images, while the ones in the second, and which is a success, as you can see the focus is on Jesus, while in the fourth, that's not the case. So it's a failure. While testing on cocoa images, we can see that the action regions are defined well, but the background is not very well separated. We found that the obstruction poses have a huge impact while constructing the compositional elements. For the action lines and regions, it is even difficult for the experts to agree sometimes on an objective measure as a result. It is very challenging to interpret these results. We saw how the gaze estimates driven by poses are well estimated and we don't need any forms of training or fine tuning. The colors of the protagonists were very well exploited for semantic foreground and background separation. And the separating boundary is also considered as a very interesting feature to understand scenes in art history. You have to notice that this is one of the first attempts to understand scenes in art history using compositional elements in computer vision techniques. Hence, there are so many things that we can improve. We could fine tune pose methods with art history data in order to better detect persons. Also, we can add scene context to the algorithm for better parsing of scenes, objects, characters, and relations. We know that the algorithm definitely requires a rigorous qualitative and quantitative evaluation. Uh, the proof of concept that we want to build later would be an image retrieval tool that uses compositional elements. With this, I would like to conclude my talk by giving the summary of contributions of this work. We proposed a no-trading approach which also turns out to be a domain agnostic with respect to data. We argued that the compositional elements provide insightful information for scene understanding in art history. And we established a proof of concept by detecting the compositional elements using computer vision techniques. That's it folks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Pratmesh, and um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for playing that. Um, yeah, we have uh, some time for short questions. We we are a bit over time, but uh, because of te technical reasons, we started a little bit later. So uh, perhaps first, I would mention that this workshop isn't over at all. We have an evening session in 10 hours at um, 10 or 11 o'clock you will see that the schedule and uh, we ha can have uh, a question or more no Do you hear me? Yes, Peter. Okay, so we have a quick question uh, from Leo in the chat. If you had perfect post detection, what gap would you still have compared to the art historical crown truth? Could you say something on that? Yes, just a second. I'm reading the question again. Leo, can I ask you to explain the gap part again? Leo?
Yeah, and, and meanwhile, we... So, Maybe so, it's so, better if I do it on the microphone instead of... Yeah, uh, please. Typing. Uh, just quickly, um, in terms of building these lines from the, the gazes and the uh, poses, if, you, if the gaze and the poses were really detected perfectly, uh, presumably the lines compared to the art historical analysis are still a little bit ambiguous or maybe depend on other things like columns or contours and, and so on. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so that's what I kind of meant by what gap. So, uh, imagine, so, no, so, yeah. so when you say that we, we don't, we are not looking to compare our uh, generated pose lines with the existing pose methods to make it better, but sometimes we see that even the poses that we can see or we can figure out usually are not detected using the pre-trained models. So the first idea was to not to do any fine tuning and check out if the uh, poses are detected well, but sometimes we find failures and that was the motivation to fine tune an open pose or a pose network to just detect more poses in an image in order to get those points. So once we get those protagonists, we can actually improve the uh, action region based on those people's uh, pose being detected. That was the whole idea. So if we miss out some people, then we miss out their directions, their gaze directions, and eventually miss out the action regions. As I actually showed on one of the uh, slide, uh, if I can share the screen quickly. Uh, let me do that. Uh, yeah, so, so my question wasn't, wasn't uh, quite to do with that, but, but presumably it's, it's still uh, imperfect, even the fine-tuned version. So uh, I'm kind of asking how much, uh, how much progress is there still to make in that direction? Uh, not super. In that direction, we are actually not looking forward to. We are more looking into uh, bettering the gazes part and, and then basically using this to do the retrieval part. So that's the idea. Okay, thanks. No, no problem. So me meanwhile, we had also a remark from Lev Manovic. Thank you for that. Uh, which uh, uh, And he, he also um, saw a lot of uh, new research opportunities in that approach and thanks for that talk. Um, are there any other last questions on, on set? Because I think uh, we have we to close soon. Till yep. the time we, we have a question, can I answer uh, Stuart's question to Andreas about the iconography or the iconology <laughs> connection that yeah, he Yeah, was, why yeah. not? Okay. Yes, so please. You had a question for Andreas and, and what we are actually working on is to understand this iconography is using um, these um, annunciation scenes, baptism scenes, and, and relate these iconographies over a period of time. That more or less is the end work. So what we are trying to do right now is in one branch does the standard uh, low level to high level things basically doing object detection um, more or less and, and understanding this relation between these objects and this is an alternate approach where we try to understand these compositional elements in order to relate these iconographies in one way or the other that's the whole perspective of it i don't know if i answered that question that you asked me yes but this is the idea that we are moving on to that's a very good answer thank you very much yeah, thank you Stuart. Yeah, so I have to thank you again, uh, Bratmesh, and thank every speaker of that morning. Uh, thanks a lot. And so, uh, Alessio, do we have to say something else? Uh, so we hope we see you uh, back in the evening. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, thank you for all the invited speaker and, and the oral session. So yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be late. <laughs> so... We, from Europe, uh, at least Italy, Germany, we stopped at 11 p.m. But uh, I think the, it's going to be very exciting, even if, if it's going to be a late time for Europe, but for the rest of USA, it's going to be pretty fun timing. So I hope to see you back again uh, very soon in 10 hours. And uh, see you back yeah. again. Okay, then bye-bye. And also thank you for the audience and discussion we, we had. Bye. Bye.